So as you can see from the title of um, my talk, which is not exactly about games, I'm, I'm optimistic about the challenges of developing uh, innovative uh, assessments. We can do it. I'm, I remain optimistic even after uh, having done the slides, actually. A quick overview. Um, <clears throat> I want to give you, uh, it's going to be somewhat narrow presentation focusing on the scalability. How do we make assessments that are innovative and, and can actually be produced in an economic fashion? For broader perspectives, I refer you to uh, Randy Bennett and Jim Pellegrino, among others, uh, uh, who discuss these matters. I, I focus primarily on two uh, issues, the issue of task production, i.e. the idea of eliciting evidence from a student. This is what we use normally items uh, for. And, and scoring, the extracting of evidence from that evidence we, we have elicited from, from students. These considerations are, are widely applicable, and they're applicable to games and well-designed educational games must have solved this in, in some fashion. Although, as I said, I'm not going into games primarily. I, um, I want to give you, uh, after giving you some brief history, what, where, where I see the state of the art, and, um, and then turn it over for questions. But first, uh, a little bit of history. Uh, Bob cited uh, the Greek site. I want to cite Aristotle, who said, uh, if you want to understand something, watch it grow. That's why I'm going, taking a little detour into uh, the history. Uh, <clears throat> the history of assessment really goes back to Imperial China, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to go <laughs> back to the 19th century, where uh, standardized uh, assessments first began in Massachusetts uh, when Horace Mann visited uh, uh, Europe and came back with some, some ideas. Also, after um, uh, the Civil War in the United States, there were two approaches to admissions testing. Uh, and, and this, uh, as you can imagine, led to a fairly um, complicated situation. This is why the College Board uh, was uh, created, to bring some order to that chaos. Initially, the um, College Board tests were constructed response, but shortly after uh, 1911 or so, the multiple choice format was, was invented and used successfully as part of the, uh, as part of the Army Alpha. <coughs> So, so this success there was picked up by uh, people like Thorndike and Wood, who, who were arguing that uh, we could use the multiple choice uh, format to create uh, scalable assessments. Uh, there were also concerns at the time about cramming uh, and things of that sort uh, that were, uh, the constructive response form I was vulnerable to. So there's this quote, uh, and I highlighted two, th two items on that quote that address the scalability that they were arguing uh, was possible with the multiple choice and, and the fact that uh, uh, one had control over the, uh, the uh, evidence uh, that one collected, comparability in this case, uh, because of the scorability of the multiple choice. This was 1922. The SATs created in 1926 is a multiple choice uh, uh, assessment. Uh, as, as, as the SAT grows, constructive response uh, diminishes and, and really struggles through, throughout uh, for much of the 20th century. <clears throat> when the United States joins uh, World War II, uh, actually the constructive response uh, remnants at the College Board were suspended because there were concerns about the uh, manpower that would not be available to actually score um, the constructive response. So again, scalability uh, seems to underline uh, some of this uh, history here. <clears throat> The, uh, the multiple choice format was not used exclusively in, in the admissions testing, as this quote uh, here suggests uh, from a study from the uh, Office of Technology, uh, the Office of Technology Assessment that by the 1930s, the multiple choice format was well entrenched already in education, in achievement, what used to be called achievement testing. So, uh, in short, the success of the multiple, uh, multiple choice assessment during the 20th century was, was in large measure, I think, 
not entirely, uh, because outside of the United States, the multiple choice didn't succeed, for example. But in the United States, with the scalability of item production and scalability uh, and, and the scorability and objectivity that uh, was afforded by that format. There were also uh, what I'm referring to as validity tailwinds. Uh, validity used to be concerned primarily with predictive concerns. And uh, in a competition between multiple choice and controlled response, the, the concert response loses because you could always add more multiple choice items to make up for whatever incremental validity there was there. So, so given this history, uh, it would seem that uh, anyone considering uh, uh, developing an assessment, an innovative assessment, uh, should, should be mindful of the fact that scalability uh, concerns will, will come to play significantly um, at one point. So the, the pendulum begins to swing uh, in the 1980s when arguments were made that, uh, about the deleterious effect of the multiple choice and, and how uh, the, the, the value in using constructive res response uh, format in an educational setting. Uh, as we know, many states deployed uh, constructed uh, response assessments. And, and unfortunately, as we know, and this story is very well told by Brian Stetcher in this uh, paper, uh, the problems of scoring reliability, among others, were so severe that these this assessments um, did, not, did not thrive. Similarly, uh, Dan Koritz talks about those issues. By the way, there's, uh, there's references and links to papers at the end of this presentation if anybody is interested. So, um, so if I'm de developing a new assessment, an innovative assessment, I start with uh, something like, like this. There's a, uh, Harry, uh, Neil mentioned yesterday KSAs. We, we need to understand what the knowledge, skills, and abilities are that are gonna be covered by uh, our assessment and have those well understood. And, and, uh, at, at, and then I would cross that with different uh, 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 forms of, uh, for, for eliciting evidence all the way from multiple choice to more innovative uh, types, of, types of formats. And then I would, I would actually begin to formulate following, uh, I'm most familiar with the ECD process, following something like an ECD process, begin to formulate design templates and to the point where we actually get to the point where we, there are task models. A task model is a way to instantiate many actual items that we would see in an assessment. These are the little stacks that you see there. The check, mark, check marks refers to the fact that I would use strategically some formats uh, to elicit some KSAs that are not elicitable with, say, a multiple choice format. When, when, when you approach uh, assessment in this form, you have task models, you have a means of instantiating uh, those task models into items. You can also begin to conceive of, of uh, test blueprints that are populated by task models uh, rather than just uh, broad specifications. And those task models could be used literally at runtime to create a form uh, or many forms uh, um, uh, for, um, for, for a given assessment. Uh, an important consideration in, the, in all of this is that when you do task models, you have expectations about what is gonna happen, how, what the difficulty of the uh, task is gonna be. And as you collect data, you can actually feed that into a loop to actually refine those task models. There are synergies, um, um, <clears throat> that I want to mention, uh, I can't go, in, in, because of the time, I can't go into this sli slide in too much detail, but I just want to highlight uh, this last item here, the APIP uh, variables, which have to do with making us uh, items accessible. Um, when you approach uh, uh, task development sort of in a systematic fashion, uh, 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 an item is an instance of a model. You can layer on that a, uh, accessibility considerations that have to do with the rendering of the item for populations with different needs. So those are synergies that uh, come as a result of approaching assessment in a kind of discipline and model-driven fashion. Um, a quick look at the state of the art. Uh, 
so in mathematics, uh, things uh, are, um, are in very good shape. Uh, the work I'm citing here by Graf and Five, they've developed uh, task models in math <clears throat> that uh, are constructed response. And one of the uh, things that these task models have is they have also generate the way the, the um, scoring information needed to actually score each instance of that task model. This is very powerful. Uh, you can imagine using that uh, and not having to worry about human scoring, not having to worry about coming up with the actual scoring criteria. It's all built in into the, the task model. There's some work in intelligent tutors uh, where they're beginning to use some of these ideas. They call it isomorphing uh, items. Um, and they use it for an interesting reason. It's because students sometimes uh, want to game the tutor. I don't know why they would want to game a tutoring, because it's a low stake situation. But uh, another um, advantage of having the ability to create multiple items that are, uh, inexpensively is the fact that you create many forms and security in the case of high stakes assessment or in the case of low stakes assessments to uh, avoid um, gaming. Also, Dan Koretz has this idea of an audit test where you use certain items to verify that performance uh, is, is okay. Oops. Um, in writing, uh, at ETS, the GRE is score, uh, there, there are many prompts, and the prompts have many variants for security reasons, and they're score with a single scoring en uh, engine and, and model. Now, to do this, the, the actual prompts have to be developed very carefully and, and uh, evaluated very carefully, but this is a case where a single scoring engine can score many, many prompts in variations on that prompt. In the uh, area of networking, they've also begun using uh, this idea of task modeling uh, for, for quite a while, but lately I've seen uh, uh, this idea of using isomorphs uh, as well. Uh, this paper and some more recent work by Roy Libby addresses this uh, at some length. Uh, science inquiry skills. Uh, I had a uh, symposium at ARA, uh, uh, last ARA with some of the key players there. I was very pleased to see, I don't follow that area closely, where uh, the scoring, uh, for example, uh, is very well developed. Uh, Bob referred to some of these uh, detectors uh, that actually, uh, by looking at clicks and so forth, make, can actually detect what the student may have been trying to do and in make inferences from that. The area of scoring short responses, um, it's a mixed bag. It began very nicely with um, Claudia Leacock and Martin Chodorow with C Raider, <clears throat> but increasingly it's become obvious that that approach, which sort of approach natural language understanding, uh, it, it's not scalable um, for a number of, of, of reasons. There more recent work right here from, from Crest, um, where it's actually also attempting to take that sort of language understanding approach. I got a quick update from Deidre on this. I think that particular approach is, um, uh, is I'm not sure what the current status is. Um, uh, um, so what has happened with short responses is um, uh, that now we're using sort of brute force approaches to actually score short answers. And, and they, it works very well, but uh, one uh, aspect of this is that the scoring function that gets developed for one item is just for that item. This means from a scalability perspective, you would have to do that for every instance of an item. If it were possible somehow to avoid that, uh, it, it would be nice, but at the moment that's where the state of the art is. <clears throat> um, in, um, <clears throat> ironically, uh, Highly innovative and scalable assessment ex have existed for a while in the area of license, professional licensing, both in architecture, in uh, medicine, and in accounting. These assessments have been operational for a while, and, and they use sim sort of simulation-like uh, approaches and automated scoring. 
Uh, one advantage they have in, this, in that context is that they can charge a lot for the assessment. So for example, the architecture assessment may be like $1,500. Um, and so uh, that's one idea, but if one were to amortize that over a much larger base, the testing population in both of these cases is are rather small. So conceivably, um, the cost would come down significantly with uh, many, many more uh, st uh, uh, students. Um, I think I'm out of time, so. Um, so I, uh, in summary, I, I think the success uh, of the multiple choice assessment uh, during the 20th century was a matter of scalability. I think for innovative assessments to eventually uh, equally successful, one has to start thinking about scalability from day one, writing one-off items, uh, interesting as they might be, uh, it, it's not gonna scale up. Similarly, with respect to scoring, to the extent that you can think about scoring from day one in connection with each, each of those SAS models, things will uh, are likely to, to scale up much more uh, easily um, in the end. Thank you very much.